When you think of Peter Jackson, what do you think of? Most of you tend to think of Lord of the Rings, and if I'm being honest, yeah, that's the first thing I think of too. But the second thing I think of is Meet the Feebles. See, before Jackson was this big world-renowned celebrity director guy, he was this average Joe director trying to break into the scene while making weird B-movies on a shoestring budget. His second film ever was Meet the Feebles. Think of Avenue Q before Avenue Q was a thing. Despite the fact it has puppets, it's got sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Although not as much rock and roll, but definitely a lot of the first two. Meet the Feebles has a very divisive reputation. You either love it or you hate it. And I thought I was gonna hate it going in. I came into it thinking, okay, this is gonna be a lot like Brickleberry or Paradise PD or Drawn Together Season 3, isn't it? Nothing but cringe, shock, and gross out. That's what I thought it was gonna be. But then I watched it. And then I watched it another time. And then I watched it another time. And then I realized, this thing is fantastic. It's not perfect, I will admit that. I'll get into some of the issues it has later down the road. But I gotta say, not only is this film really well done, but nobody seems to understand why it's well done. In a way, I didn't even know either. I had to think about it. And on my second viewing, I finally saw what this film had to offer. Meet the Feebles has way more to it than people seem to recognize, and that's what I'm gonna address today. Let me tell you people why Meet the Feebles is secretly brilliant. What's the story of Meet the Feebles? Boy, is that the million dollar question, because there's like a hundred stories going on in here. Some major, some minor, some that are more running jokes, but it does have an overall arcing narrative. Basically, there's this theater group called The Feebles, and they're about to get this prime time TV slot, and it's gonna be making or breaking their entire careers, so they're getting ready to make this pilot. However, it's not all about the show, as we get to see some of the seedy underbelly of what goes on in the deep, dark depths of the show industry. Hardly any of these guys are good people. In fact, most of them are downright evil. The worst kind of people imaginable. Well, not people per se, they're puppets and that, that they're animals. Most of them. Obby's a human, but let's not dwell on that. This doesn't sound good on paper. A movie about a bunch of jerks being jerks to each other and doing horrible things? Well, yeah, that's kind of what the movie is, but it does a few things differently. For one, the movie is very clear about who we're supposed to like and who we're not supposed to like. We're supposed to like the kind-hearted people like Heidi, Robert, or Lucille, or Arthur, but we're not supposed to like the evildoers like Bletch, Trevor, or F.W. Fly. So we're never supposed to sympathize with these monstrosities. Instead, we're supposed to watch in awe at the horrible things they do, all while knowing that sometime down the road, they're gonna get what's coming to them, and then some. And the second thing that sets it apart is that not everybody's awful. Like I said, there's good people in there. Heidi, Robert, Lucille, Arthur, just to name a couple. To be fair, that's probably the extent of it, as there are a couple morally gray people like Sid or Sebastian, but these are the only really good people. Until something happens in the end, but let's save that till, well, appropriately, the end of this. In particular, Robert and Lucille seem to be basically pure and blameless in this entire cast. They're the new people who've just joined on. They're only recent additions to the chorus, and they haven't yet had time to become demented or disturbed or greedy in any sort. In fact, they're probably too naive and trusting for their own good. Like in a Disney movie, they fall in love and get engaged within hours of meeting each other, and that's really the joke. Robert and Lucille are so childlike and so idealistic that that's how they see things. Things are supposed to be like fairy tales in Disney movies. You can see this in the various interactions they have with people. For example, no matter how nasty Winyard or Trevor are to Robert, he will only return them with kindness or innocent, childlike confusion. Simple as that. He never calls anybody names, he never even really gets angry unless someone tries to hurt one of his friends. Lucille is also just as innocent, too naive and trusting for her own good, which kinda gets her into some trouble. But you can tell just how much they wanted to push this whole innocence angle that they can't even say swear words, or even things that might even be hot button words. For example, whenever Lucille is talking about rape, she always says ravish. 
She never says the actual word. It provides a good contrast, and if I'm being honest, this is probably the reason they're so popular. Their characters aren't necessarily the most well fleshed out, at least in the obvious spectrum, but people latch onto these guys a lot. You can't find someone who's seen this movie and doesn't like Robert and Lucille. And why is that? Well, it's the same reason that Clara is one of the most popular members of the Drawn Together gang. In a sea of sin and vile corruption, the innocence tends to stand out more. Everything they do is so naive and sweet and ah, it kinda gets ya. And it does have its funny moments, so it's not played entirely straight. It's funny, it's cute, and it really gets to stand out because it's the only shining light in a sea of awful. And let's talk about that sea of awful because, oh man, it's messed up in the best kind of way. Do you know who this is? Well, if you don't, I'm gonna introduce you. This is Bletch. He's the main villain of the movie and he owns the Feebles acting troupe. He is a rich, greedy, power-hungry man who only sees people as a means to an end. Nobody matters except for him. As soon as somebody annoys him or outlives their usefulness, he has them fired at best and murdered at worst. You do not want to get on his bad side. Showing the complete opposite of someone like Robert or Lucille, Fletch is someone who's had a lot of experience in the industry, thereby letting every single bad thing it has to offer get to him and control him. Perhaps maybe one day he was a good upstanding walrus, but now he's an absolute demon. He demands respect and a lot of profit. Basically, almost all of the bad things that happen to anybody in this movie are because of him or his henchmen, which he controls. All of his henchmen do exactly what he says whenever he wants it, because if they don't, they're gonna die. They know that, and so does he. Because of this, Bletch kinda gives off this air of, I'm the best person ever, nobody can touch me. And that's exactly what happens. He does horrible, unspeakable things to people, and up until the end doesn't get what's coming to him. He keeps getting off scot-free and heck, sometimes even making a profit off of it. Keep all that stuff in mind as we get to the next part, Heidi. Although Meet the Feebles is an ensemble movie, Heidi is the main character of the film. She used to be a young starlet who sang at nightclubs until Bletch discovered her, and then swept her off her hippopotamus feet with promises of fame and fortune. But clearly, because Bletch doesn't really care, it's very clear he's not talking about Heidi getting rich and famous, he's talking about getting himself rich and famous. But of course, using his presumably good looks and smooth talking abilities, he's able to win Heidi over. And then they form a relationship of sorts. And this is probably one of the deepest aspects of the film that unfortunately it doesn't really delve into. It's very heavily implied that Heidi and Bletch's relationship is psychologically abusive, to put it simply. A lot of gaslighting and a lot of what I say goes, and you better be sorry if you say anything that makes me slightly upset. We see this whenever Heidi feels any emotion of any kind. Whenever she's happy, she talks about Bletch or goes to tell Bletch whenever she's upset. She goes to Bletch and tries to get comfort, trying to get his love and security. Whenever she feels stressed, she goes to Bletch. Always Bletch, always him. He's the center of her world because Bletch made it that way. Bletch states in the beginning that the only reason he has her around is to profit off of her. He doesn't like her. He doesn't find her attractive in any way anymore. All he wants is to use her. He really has an attraction to Samantha, the Siamese cat. But Heidi, no matter how much obvious proof she gets that Bletch is cheating on her and has no interest in her, she goes in complete denial. She will never, ever accept that, even when faced with dead-on eyewitness evidence. Because the minute Bletch comes back around, not even apologizing, but just kind of putting the moves on her in a very half-hearted way, she immediately goes back to all happiness and smiles. Bletch is her world, and that's what a lot of abusers do to their victims. In order to keep control, they make their victim's entire world revolve around them. And that's exactly what Heidi's going through. Everything has to either relate to Bletch, be Bletch, or be about pleasing Bletch in some way. She doesn't have any more independence. 
and all this denial and all this focus and attachment on this guy, who's really the worst person ever, goes completely over her head, meaning that when eventually he decides to finally own up to, hey, I don't like you anymore, get out of here, I hate you, she has no reason to live anymore. Bletch made himself her whole world, and now that that world is gone, what does she have to live for? So Heidi gives up, essentially. She doesn't know what to do, she doesn't know how to go through life, and her entire consciousness snaps. This causes her to do, well, let's be real, one of the things that everybody knows about this film, the massacre scene. Heidi goes on a homicidal rampage with a machine gun killing almost all of the secondary cast, and some of the primary characters, too. Hardly anyone makes it out alive. But even still, Bletch tries to manipulate her in this state, and it proves to have still worked. However, eventually she realizes she's been tricked and kills Bletch, but as soon as she pulls the trigger and shoots the walrus right in the mouth, she snaps back to reality and realizes what she's done. She feels great remorse for killing the only man she's ever loved this way. The entire point of existing for her. Even after all this, the psychological wounds are still there and have once again reopened. And that's kind of where the movie ends. Heidi realizes that she's done something terrible and then gets hauled away while singing her song Garden of Love, regretting the fact that she killed Bletch and all of her old friends. This is one of the driving plots of the entire movie, and it's not really touched upon in an obvious way. But when you pick up on the dialogue and the specific words they use, and the way that the characters move around each other, especially when Heidi and Bletch are alone together, you really pick up on what's going on. Now, I'm definitely sure this was intentional. There's no way it wasn't. This film, despite being a comedy, knows how to do the drama very well. The rest of the characters' stories aren't as plot-heavy or theme-heavy, but they do have their own interesting qualities. Sure, there's some more taboo ones like Sid having a paternity suit slapped onto him, or Winyard struggling with his drug addiction, but in the end, they mostly serve a purpose, with one or two exceptions. One of the things I always say I love about shows or movies or anything like that is where they have characters that are very versatile, None of them feel the same to each other. You can throw them in any kind of situation and see what happens. That's exactly what Meet the Feebles is. It takes this bizarre assortment of characters, each one as disturbed as the last, with some exceptions, and then throws them in a giant stage and then watches them go at it. You know what this movie's like? It's like an ant farm. You know those giant boxes of sand that you throw ants into and watch them go through life? Well, that's exactly what this is. Only get a bunch of fire ants, and then a couple normal ants, put them all in there, and then watch them go at it. That's what Meet the Feebles is. You're watching these people be themselves, really, intermixing, and going on crazy misadventures. The whole movie was built around being a parody of the worst aspects of humanity, being addictions, sex, violence, greed, revenge, so on and so forth. That's what it does well. It showcases all of this while making it perfectly clear who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, and who the morally ambiguous ones are that we're not really supposed to know how to feel towards. People like Harry, for instance. Harry is basically the Kermit the Frog of the show. He gets diagnosed with <clears throat> the big one, which is some kind of presumed sexual transmitted disease, and he thinks his life is ending. Before this, we've seen Harry as a bit of a jerk, thinking himself really, really high up and God's gift to women, all while on stage presenting himself as a fun, happy, bouncy bunny. But then he kind of gets more sympathetic as he gets more and more desperate trying to find some way to reverse this, all when some evil paparazzi fly is trying to make his life worse by exploiting his condition for a story. Not really plot heavy, but definitely interesting. And I will say that's what this whole film is. It's interesting. There's a lot going on, and there's hardly ever a dull moment. The songs are unbelievably catchy, and it makes me kind of disappointed that the only way to get this soundtrack is on a very rare vinyl. Each one's catchy, memorable, and perfectly reflects the characters who sing them. What's not to love? As much as I really like this film, I will say there are a couple issues I have with it. For one, 
it seems a little too unfocused sometimes. I know the whole point of it is, again, the ant farm analogy. Dump these people in and see the magic. But maybe there's a little too much of that. There's two things I can point to in particular. That being the porno scene with Madame Bovine and the drug deal stuff. Personally, the porn scene kinda outlived its welcome pretty quickly. If we ended it with Robert going away after realizing he ruined the take, I think that would've been fine. If we cut out all the stuff with Dennis and the masked masochist, we wouldn't have lost anything. Not even any of the plot, really. And the drug deal stuff, while awesome to watch in its climactic end, doesn't really do anything with the plot. It gives Trevor and Bletch more to do, but that's really it. It doesn't serve any overarching purpose except for Bletch eventually finding out what Harry's going through. But that could have been done any other way. Still, I did like that fight scene like I said. Plot-wise, it doesn't exactly fit. One other thing I'd like to note is the humor. It's very hit and miss. For every joke that works, there's one that doesn't. Let me give you an example. One of the biggest plagues to adult media is gross and shocking for the sake of gross and shocking. While Meet the Feebles is often characterized as one of these, I don't see it entirely. Sure, there are some gross out bits, but more often than not, they're actually well thought out. For example, Harry's vomit on stage isn't just funny because her 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 he vomited. It's funny for two other reasons. One, just how over the top it is and everyone's reaction to it. And then two, it kind of subverts you. See, in the beginning, there's a part where Harry does his intro correctly, and this time, you're not quite sure where it's going. But he does end up getting up to his spot, and it looks like he's about to do it, only to, whoops, nope, he doesn't. Or there's the doctor who diagnoses Harry. His name is Dr. Quack, not just because he's a duck, but also because he's the worst doctor ever. Like I said, there's some spoilers in here, so I'm gonna get right into it. Harry doesn't have the big one. He has some other minor disease called the bunny pox. Not only does this doctor utterly fail at diagnosing Harry, but he's so casual about it and even has the audacity to ask for money right after telling him the news. It's humor like this that works in the film. But then there are those moments that don't. I will say, Personally, as a fan of things like South Park and Drawn Together, my tolerance for this humor is probably a bit higher than the average moviegoer. So it does take a little bit for me to be off-put. So nothing in Meet the Feebles really disturbed me, but there were some jokes that weren't really impressive because, to me at least, they felt like they were only there to be shocking and didn't have the substance needed to go with them. As I've said many times before, shocking on its own is not a joke. But like I said, most of the time at least, Meet the Feebles is able to have those shocking elements, albeit probably a bit further than you'd expect or probably even tolerate, and have some good humor to go alongside with it and have more than just the gross out. But it's stuff like the fly eating Harry's excrement or again that porno scene that's just there to be shocking and gross that kinda get me to lose interest a little bit. Now there is one more complaint I'd like to make, but it's not about the movie itself. It's about the DVD. This is the worst DVD ever. This thing is an officially licensed Meet the Feebles DVD, and it's absolute trash. Not only are there no bonus features, but this is terrible video quality. If you look up Meet the Feebles on YouTube and find the full movie, that's what you get, because it turns out, when they were making this thing, they didn't use a master copy. They used a rip of the original VHS, which, in and of itself, was a rip from a theater copy. Which is why there's a bunch of hairs and cigarette burns on any copy you can find. This makes it really annoying. As someone who really likes this movie, I want to own it with maybe some bonus features or at least good video quality. Sadly, no. There isn't anything like that. Meet the Feebles is almost impossible to find in good quality aside from one fan restoration. But it shouldn't have to be a fan restoration. Meet the Feebles has a strong cult following. A cult following I can say that I'm happily a part of. And we would love to see a remaster of it. You heard it here folks, the worst part about Meet the Feebles is finding Meet the Feebles in good quality. 
But if you're willing to sit through some iffy video quality or watch the fan restoration, I'd actually recommend watching it. I will say, first and foremost, it's not for everybody. If you don't like it, I 110% understand why. You kind of have to have a little bit of a specific set of interests. Things like South Park or Drawn Together, you gotta like stuff like that to like meet the feebles. And even then, it's not guaranteed. But if you're interested, check it out. And be on the lookout for some of the deeper elements to it. Because if you go on blind, you might see Meet the Feebles as nothing but shock and gross out. But if you really look into it, and understand the more complex themes, maybe you'll have a better time when you meet the Feebles. Well folks, thank you very much for watching. What'd you think of the video? Did you ever hear about that awful DVD that this thing has? Comment below and let me know because I'm always excited to hear what you guys have to say. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys next time.